Hey, what's up everyone? How's it going? Dave here. Today's tutorial, I'm going to teach you about the most important concept in photography, and that's color theory. So in short, color theory just teaches you what colors look great together, so you can stay away from colors that don't look great together. So we're going to do two things today. First, we're going to study my favorite landscape painter of all time, Albert Bierstadt. He's the master of color, so we can learn a lot from him, and I'm going to show you how to do that. Second, we're going to process this raw file from Patagonia from start to finish, and I'm going to show you how to apply color theory to it using the color wheel within Photoshop, the HSL sliders, hue, saturation, and luminance, as well as the color picker, which allows you to select different colors and apply them to your photo. So let's dive right in. We're going to get it started. All right, let's do this. I'm pumped up to teach you guys about this because it's one of my favorite topics. So Albert Bierstadt, take a look at all his paintings here. He painted as part of the Hudson River School. Uh, you can go to albertbierstadt.org, and I'll put a little link for that below as well so you can check him out. And this video was made along with a blog post on my website that is extremely detailed, and it talks through all this stuff step by step. So it's great to see it through video. I'm going to show you guys how to apply it to your photos, but it's also great to read it because you're really going to pick it up and remember it that way. So reference the link below and above this video up here so you can jump on that blog post and check it out. Within Photoshop, first thing I'm going to do is discuss color with you, the RGB color model, color wheel, and all that good stuff so you can easily understand me while we talk about color theory. First thing you'll need to do is go into Photoshop and you can pull up the color wheel by going to Extensions and Adobe Color Themes and that can pop up over here and you can organize it however you want. The second thing we need to discuss is how this color wheel is actually designated, what's going on here, how it works. So to do that, I'm going to pull up the HSV or HSB color scale. So this says value. This is also known as brightness. So within Photoshop, they call this hue, saturation, brightness. Value and brightness are the exact same thing. So we can look at this color wheel over here, and we'll notice that these are the same colors that you find around the top of this cylinder here. So if we look around the top there, that's the same colors that are found around here. All colors around the very outside of this top, or the very outside of the top of the cylinder, are known as hues. So a hue is a fully saturated color. So you'll see the saturation scale here within the HSB color scale goes from pure white all the way out to fully saturated color. So pure white is found at the direct center right here. And as we move out, that color is becoming more and more saturated. So if you add white to a hue, so let's say you have the blue hue right here. As you add white to that hue, it becomes less and less saturated. As you add more hue to it or more blue, it becomes more and more saturated. And then you have value, also known as brightness. So this, you can just cross that out. Remember, it's brightness instead. This is from Wikipedia. So just grab that as an easy reference. Brightness, since it can't be shown in a 3D rendering on your color wheel, it's just going to be shown with this slider right here. So brightness goes on the scale from black all the way up to color. Let's grab our color picker right here, and we'll, we'll see how this works, right? We'll do a, a little a brain game. So we'll start with hue, so it should be up close to the top. Now these colors won't be perfect, but as you can see, if I sample right here, it's going to be at the very top of that scale, right? If I drag in here, you'll see that actually move on the color picker. It's pretty neat. If I drag in here, it'll start at the top. It'll just start to move down on that color picker if I keep it right on the edge there, right? If I drag in here somewhere, you'll see that. So this square box right here, that's that same as that plane. If I pick over here, fully saturated color or hue. If I drag down this line, you can see the old color picker starts to move towards white, becoming desaturated, adding white is tinting. Then I could pull it down and you would see it drop down along that line right there as well, right? And you could pull right here and right here. So I just outlined that little square. That's that plane. And you could cut this any way you want. Those are just the planes that they show us for this specific. So hue, saturation, brightness. So now that you know how this little color model works or color wheel, whatever you'd like to call it, and the color picker, we're going to jump into color theory. So within color theory, there is a term called color harmony. Color harmony just gives you a set of rules or different examples of different colors that look great together, which keeps you from mixing colors that don't look so great together. So if you're, if you're taking a photograph or looking at a photograph and you're like, why does this just look off or why does this just look bad? It's probably because it's not part of a color harmony. By following different color harmonies, you can learn how to mix color in a really nice way. So before we start with color harmony, we have to learn a key concept and that concept is key color. Key color is the main color or dominant color in that work of art. Um, with looking at this, the key color is probably blue. So if we if we grab our color picker again, this is a really good thing to do. You can download Bierstadt's work on his website or online and do this. If I go ahead and grab this, I'm going to pull up the color picker because I always like to reference. So let's pull this up and let's sample. When I sample here, it's going to show over here what that color is right here. So even though this looks black to us, 
it's actually a really shade it's a shade of blue so remember shading is adding black to something so it's almost black but there's some blue in it as well so if we go up here in the clouds see that's blue and you're noticing that our hues are standing with within this range right here the blue slash cyan range so if we go over here it's also in that range so you'll see that key color is exhibited a lot within this photograph key color is blue so key color is just your dominant color and off of the key color you can select a color harmony so when you're out in the field shooting or taking a photo, it's great if you're able to select a key color and have a little knowledge of the color wheel and color harmonies, and then you can come back and edit that much easier back at home. But you can also adjust those in Photoshop, as I'll show you in a little bit. So let's select a key color here. Any, any shade of blue will work, so I'll just select right here. And to send that as the key color over here to the color wheel, you first select the box in the middle, that's the key color box, and then you can just set, set selected color from active color. This is your active color, and it's just taking this color and copying it right to here for you. And that's how that works. And now I'm going to use another example. We're going to talk about different color harmonies. So I just opened another Albert Bierstadt work of art over here. I'm going to select the key color for this, which I think is also blue. And I'm just guessing at these. I'm taking educated guesses at the key color. But I'd say it's blue. Without blue, this thing would fall apart. Green and yellow don't look together. They don't look great together just by themselves. They need that blue to offset. So let's, uh, let's select blue again. So now that I've selected blue as my key color, my active color right here, and sent it over here to my key color, I can talk about complementary or direct color harmony. So direct or complementary color harmony is the most simple color harmony. It's just the opposite on the color wheel from your key color. So if we use that or blue as our key color, our direct complementary color would lie directly across from it on the color wheel. So you can see Bierstadt probably used a complementary or direct color harmony in this painting. He said, all right, I have blue. I want to offset that blue with a nice color. What can I use? Well, if I go directly across to my color wheel, I can see a nice color of yellow or orange would work pretty well. And you'll notice that if I sample this, it's not always going to be a fully saturated color. A lot of the color he uses is not at full saturation, I meaning it's not all the way over to the right hand side of this, this color cube. If I sample down here, it's not all the way over. This blue is not fully saturated either. This blue doesn't have much saturation at all. Remember, something that's close to white is less and less saturated. Something that's over here on the right hand side is more and more saturated. You can see this saturation scale as I drag it from full saturation to no saturation that moves from 100% to zero. So you can kind of see the saturation value. So a good, a good rule of thumb to keep in mind, things don't always have to be fully saturated to look nice and vivid in a color. These are very vivid looking colors, but they're not fully saturated colors. They look really nice together. So complementary color harmony, also called a direct color harmony. Pretty easy to keep in mind. You can also offset that by using what are called warm and cool colors. Warm colors are found on this top right half of the color wheel. They're warm magenta, red, yellow, orange, and then cool colors go from like a, a cooler magenta to a cooler green around this bottom half. So those are also working very well to offset each other. You'll notice that if you pick a key color that is in the warm side, say we pick a key color like right here, it's in the warm side, the direct complementary of that will be in the cool side. So direct complementary is going to be warm versus cool. It's a good way to offset your photos and make them look nice together. It also helps the eye move from this nice light that's touching on the grass. It's going to start here. Your eye's probably going to start here. Move up through the photo. Catch this nice warm light right here. Curl around here and it's going to be like, oh, where do I go? Well, I want to look back here in this nice depth created through that cool dark color. So let's jump to the next one. The next one is light complementary, but it's slightly different. It's called split complementary. So to find my split complementary colors, first I'll select my key color with my color picker. I can hit I to do that and select any of these different, different tones of blue up here. And it'll go to my color right here. I can set that as my key color. And the key color is right now. So let's talk about split complementary color. If I went directly across from my key color right here, that would be my complementary color. Split complementary just lies on both sides of that complementary color, but it does not include the complementary color. So a split complementary would look something like this. The split complementary colors to that key color of blue would be this range right in here. So maybe like a, a yellow, a different, different color of yellow or a different color of red or orange. Now just remember, these don't have to be exact colors. They could be out in this range. They could be in here farther. They could be shifted over a little bit. They just have to be in the close range. And if you get too far out of that range, you'll notice that the colors no longer look good together. So if I go over towards magenta, that's not really split complementary anymore because that blue and magenta wouldn't look too nice together. So if we sample throughout this, let's do a little study of, of this painting. If we sample here and we pull up our color picker, you're gonna see that these aren't very saturated as well. Uh, up in the sky, the blue clouds, they it's a, it's a very blue sky, but you'll notice that 
the saturation value is only about 50%. So saturation here is only about 50%. If we went way over here, it would probably just look unnatural. So just watch that saturation slider when you're working in Photoshop. Our eyes can kind of fill in or our brain can kind of fill in the rest if we're looking at this. Another thing to keep in mind is we talked in about warm and cool colors, right? When light hits an object, it's going to normally display a warm color. So let's think about this. This, uh, this, this rock up here, this is Yosemite Valley before it got destroyed by us, the human tourist. When light hits this rock, even though the rock is probably gray or dark, if we sample the rock, you can see it's, it's, it's displaying as pretty warm. It's displaying as a light color, somewhere in the orange range. Same with this grass down here. Uh, the grass might be yellow or oranges, but it's definitely getting hit by some light from this light source, so it's going to be displaying the warm color range. Remember, warm colors are up here, where cool colors are down here. Cool colors are normally displayed in shadows, where if I look back here at the falls, even though the falls are naturally white or who knows what color, maybe like an off-white blue, they're displayed back in the shadows. So he used this bluish color. If we pull up the color picker, it's kind of a, a desaturated bluish color to show that that's back in the shadows. It also adds some depth compared to this warm orange right here of the trees. So really nice split complementary colors there. Once again, I'm just taking a guess at this. I think this is probably a split complementary color harmony. So analogous color harmony, let's talk about that one. I think they might have analogous here, they do. So if we look at analogous, first let's set our key color. I bet you can guess what it is this one. It's, it's probably like a red or an orange. So let's pick it right here, active color, send it over to key color, and there we go. So analogous color harmony, as you can see, here's our key color, and on both sides of that, the different range of colors are analogous. So within this one, you have all different range of warm colors. He's using warm up here, uh, he's using warm throughout here. Um, if we sample, this blue or green, let's see what it actually, let's see what actual color it is. Sometimes what your eyes see as a different color don't actually show up as that color in the color picker. So it's a nice trick. You can also look at stuff in nature, like look out over a landscape when sunlight's hitting a bunch of trees. You'd think that trees are green, but when sunlight hits them, they're not really that green. They're like an off greenish yellow color. So always study that stuff when you're walking through the woods. It'll help you be a better landscape or travel photographer. So if we look at that, these are still in if, if, even when we hover over them, they're still very close to being like different, uh, different colors of warm. Um, we're still down in this hue range, so we know we're, we're still in the warm color range. It just looks off to our eye because they're less and less saturated, right? So all he did is desaturate that or bring it towards white and probably brought it towards black a little as well. So another term, another art term you guys can use is you have tenting, which is adding white to something. So we go tent. If you add black to something, you're toning, you're also darkening. But if you add tone, if you tone something, it's basically adding black and white or gray at the same time. So it'd be going from here, and if you add black and white at the same time, that'd be toning something. So shading, adding black, tenting, adding white, toning, adding gray. It can be any amount of gray. It didn't have to be 50% gray going right down the middle there. So just a few things to keep in mind. If you hear people say tent, shade, and tone, that's what they are. So that's the analogous color harmony. You just select your key color and it's colors on both sides. Now these don't have to be perfect. They could they could be at different areas. Uh, that doesn't have to be perfection, right? You can, you can display them out a little bit, uh, but if you go too far out here, you get too wide, you're gonna be out of the you're gonna be out of the color harmony. If we had like a key color and then mixed it with green, it wouldn't look so good. So it might be analogous, but it's not a color harmony. So that's a nice thing you could use for sunrise, sunset. This works very well. So let's pop over to the next one, which is triadic. This is one of my favorite paintings of his. I'm not sure where it was taken. It could be like California coast. He did a lot of painting in Washington. He did a lot of painting in California, the Sierra Nevada range, beautiful area. Let's look at this one. And it's the triadic. This is also called the triad. So the first thing we'll do is we'll select the key color. It's probably green or blue. With triad, it doesn't matter as much. So let's select blue again. You'll notice he uses a lot of blue in his photos or his paintings, I should say. Active color, select key color and triad. All right, you can see that the triad is just evenly spaced around the color wheel. So you have the key color, and then evenly spaced around that wheel are the triad color harmonies. So let's look at this one. He said, I have a key color that's probably blue. So he decided to use a color harmony of like some yellow and some green in here. So I bet this color right here, this range, is gonna be right in here. If we pull that up, you can see that it is. It's right in this region. If we go down here, it's some blue in there, and then he uses some yellow or orange as we can see over here down in this region with the seal. So this is kind of saying there's some light source coming in and shining. Uh, there's all this light getting hit by the wave. So the light's probably coming like right in here. Anything that's getting hit with the light source is gonna be in the warm half of the color wheel where all shadows will probably be in the cool half. So even though this rock is the same color here as it is here, 
you can see that the color is going to change a little bit. Another tip he used here is he, uh, he, he put things there in the foreground and made them darker, and that haze came into the background. He added depth by adding some nice light and some misty haze back here. Thing became less and less defined. You can see nice, detailed, sharp edges here in the front close to you, and as that light transitions into the back, things become less and less sharp, and that provides depth. You can do the same thing using like a Gaussian blur within Photoshop, or if you have real fog out there when you're shooting landscapes, as you often do in the morning. When he's doing this, anything that's going to be hitting with direct light source, you can see if things get really, really bright, they're almost going to display white, right? So even though this seal is black, it's getting touched by light there, so it's almost uh, completely white. So things that get hit by direct sunlight, the more and more sunlight they get hit by, the closer to white they get and less saturated. So if something's hit by really, really bright sunlight, it's probably going to become fairly close to white. Like this green ocean or this dark green ocean hit by light got whiter, right? So you go from dark, and as it goes up here, it's going to get closer to white, or it's going to get lighter and lighter. And this is the last color harmony we're going to talk about, and I'm going to show you guys how to apply this to your photos. Let's talk about the square, or also known as rectangular color harmony. Let's see if they have this for us. Uh, they do not, but that's okay. They have some other ones you can play with, though. So the square color harmony. I'm going to make a custom color harmony. Uh, let's look at this one. I think the key color in this is probably green or blue. It's definitely a dark or a cool color. So let's uh, grab our color picker. Let's see how the key color works if we select like a, a greenish color. I need to take this off. So maybe like a green or a blue. I bet these green shades are almost in the uh, in the blue hue. See how they're working up close to cyan right there? We could select, I don't know, somewhere in here. And I'll hit OK. And then I'll select that as my key color. So if that's my key color, a square, you're just going to offset these all by the same amount. So a square would look like a square. All your color harmonies are square. So you have something like this. And you can you can space them as, as you like. They don't have to be a perfect square. Let's go right here. Say something like that. So you can see my key color. Then you have directly across from your key color, which would be a complementary. And then you have another form of complementary colors, which make up a total square. You could also move these out further. You could do like a rectangular kind of pattern. Anywhere in there, they're going to work pretty well together. This is a very hard color harmony to utilize because there's so many different colors in it. So let's see what he did here. He has the blue, which is right here, that's exhibiting up in here. And remember, for color harmony, they could be anywhere in or out, less or more saturated, as far as lighter or darker as well. You can increase or decrease the brightness. The key is that they lie in a certain range of hues. Then the green, he has green here. Uh, hitting when light comes in and hits it's going to make that green a little bit more saturated and then far out here He's got reds up on Mount Adams here There's some touches of red here around the edges and then we have yellows down here where the Indians are He's got let's see if we can zoom in here and check this out. It's pretty neat. His detail is amazing uh, It looks like you got an old campfire here Maybe a dog some squalls and some chiefs or something back here and that light fading in the side the clouds hitting and that just adds some really nice depth to the whole photo. So he probably used a square or a rectangular color, color harmony here in this in this image. Really nice image of Mount Adams. If you ever get a chance to visit Mount Adams, do it. Climb it. It's a great mountain. All right, now that we've covered all the basic color harmonies, we're going to go through and edit this photo in Photoshop using Adobe Camera Raw and these color harmonies that we just talked about. So before we do that, I want to jump back to this Mount Adams painting real quick and discuss three key technical terms that are often confused. And those terms are luminance, brightness, and lightness. Now, lightness can also be called luminosity, so we're going to discuss each of these. So luminance is the first one we're going to discuss. Luminance is an actual measured value. So when I turn my, cons my computer screen up or down, the luminance decreases or increases. And I'll just set it back to where it was nominal before. So you could actually put a meter on this screen and read the luminance that's coming out of it. Same thing goes for reflected light. So if the sun shines on an object in, in the natural world, such as this mountain, this mountain's actually going to put off a luminance, so you can actually measure that. It's a measured value. It's not perceived. The next thing we're going to talk about is brightness. So brightness is how we perceive luminance. So let's think of our human eye perception of luminance. So let's think of this computer screen here, my laptop screen, in a dark room. It's going to look very bright. But if I take the same screen outside where it's already bright, it won't look as bright. So the same concept can also apply to color. So let's take the color picker. We'll pull up the color picker sampler here. So let's look at this. We have brightness values right here. So Let's pick a red hue. This is a maximum brightness, so that's a, that's a bright red. Now, if you add black, that red starts to get darker. See that? So that's a dark red. So brightness is just on a level from dim, which is black, to bright. 
So there's no actual numerical value associated with brightness or a way to measure it. It's just how we perceive certain objects of color and light within a scene. So within photography, luminance and brightness don't really matter that much. The reason I taught you those is because they are key for understanding lightness. Lightness is also called luminosity. So when you hear somebody say a luminance histogram, that's actually incorrect. It's a luminosity histogram or a lightness histogram. So let's talk about lightness. Lightness is the perceived brightness of a given object on the scale of black to white when compared to a purely white object. So that kind of sounds confusing, but let's visualize it and see what happens. Let's grab it again here. I'm going to go over here and you'll notice that the scale of black to white over here, that's lightness. That's the lightness scale right there. So if I select a color, let's just select something up in here. I'm going to select that color right there. So on a scale of black to white, this color has a lightness value of 67. So that means it's 67% as bright as white. So it's kind of in the mid-tones tonal range, right? So let's pick some other colors and see what they do. Let's pick these dark greens down here. So you could say that this green color has a lightness value of 24. That means it's only 24% as bright as pure white. So all it's doing is it's comparing the color or the tone that you select, and it's comparing it to pure white. So that's what it means when we say that lightness is the perceived brightness, what you see as the brightness of a given object. So we could select any color being the given object on a scale of black to white, when compared to pure white. So pure white up here, what is this object compared to pure white? Well, it looks like it's 87%. So it's 87% as bright as pure white. That's what lightness means. So that sounds an awful like, like an image histogram. So any of you that are familiar with the image histogram, I'll pull one up real quick. And this is actually called a luminosity histogram, not a luminance histogram, as many say, but you can continue to use luminosity. Let's talk about the luminosity histogram. On the far left, you have pure black pixels. On the far right, you have pure white pixels. In the direct center, you have 50% gray. It's the mixture of half black and half white. That's why it lies in the direct center. So for a histogram, as pixels become more and more present in the picture, they stack up higher and higher in the histogram. So for this tonal value right here, for this pixel tonal value, it's just saying that you have a lot of pixels present in this certain image that stack up in that tonal value. So that's luminosity or lightness histogram. It's just a way to show your different lightness values of different pixels throughout an image digitally. Um, you can apply that to your photography as well, which we'll go over in a little bit. So lightness. Lightness is the perceived brightness on a scale of black to white when compared to another purely white object. Now they have to be under the same lighting conditions as well, but on a computer screen, they're always under the same lighting conditions. So really drive it home. So I'll just pick up my color picker. Now I have these dots or these pure hues. Remember a hue is a fully saturated color. So we have hues, we have different colors here. We have red, which is at, if I sample this, should, they should all be at 100% brightness. So 100% brightness, we have blue at 100% brightness, yellow at 100% brightness. But the key here is if we take all of the saturation away, if we remove it and put it on a scale of black to white, the lightness values of these, what our eyes perceive as their brightness on a scale of black to white changes. So this blue and this yellow are both 100% brightness but their lightness values are much different. If we go on a, a tonal scale of black to white, you'll notice that blue appears to be much darker. So if you look at this blue, it looks to be darker than yellow, even, even though they're both 100% brightness. So yellow appears to be very, very light, whereas blue appears to be much darker. So if you put yellow and blue next to each other, they're gonna add a nice color contrast because contrast is the change from a brighter or darker scale within an image. So you have a dark right next to a light it's gonna provide a lot of depth to that image. It's gonna help the eye to move through it. Same goes for red. So red is not quite as dark as blue, but it's pretty close. Remember, these are all 100% brightness, but their lightness values are slightly different. So you could say that yellow is a very light color. It's almost as light as pure white. So this is pure white. Yellow is almost as light as pure white. Um, green, cyan, they're also very light colors. And then you have red, blue, magenta. They're a little bit darker. So the same thing applies here. And this is why I really wanted to show this painting to you guys. You have blue up here and then you have yellow right here. Now within the image, they're very close to the same brightness, but their lightness values are much different. So your eye sees a large contrast between this mountain right here and it divides it up and helps your eye to move through the picture by adding depth with the blue complementary color in the background. So I'm going to tell you again, this stuff is going to take a while to sink in if you haven't seen it before. Edit a lot of images, study a lot of images, upload these Albert Bierstadt photos, upload any photos from the internet, whatever you want to do, but just study with your color picker and see how different lightness and brightness values are affected. So now for the fun part, let's edit this photo. So what I have here is just a smart object within Photoshop. A smart object just lets me open this back up within Adobe Camera Raw if I double click it. If you want to do a smart object out of Camera Raw instead of a regular file, whatever they export, you can just click this bottom on Camera Raw 
and just put color space pro photo RGB or whatever color space you use and open in Photoshop as smart objects. That always allows you to jump back and reuse it again. So this is an uned, pretty much unedited RAW file. I've done a few adjustments, but this is an Adobe Camera RAW, which is very much like Lightroom. They run on the same processing engine. You can see that this is sunrise. The peaks are nice and bright, catching that first light of the day. So let's look at the different colors in this. If we go up here, we can see the yellow and the blue. So those are those are complementary, direct complementary colors as we've gone over in the color harmony section before. So I'm just gonna go ahead and quickly process this. But the key I wanna show you is how easy it is to get nice looking images which is a few additions of color, especially specific color harmonies within your image. So what I'll do here, I'll pull up the blacks a little bit. And this is not a this is not a tutorial on photo editing, so I'm not really gonna go through and explain each step along the way. If you wanna learn more about photo editing, I'm gonna provide some more videos with that stuff later. So I'll just pull down the whites a little bit, and then I might just go down here and bring up the tone curve, just to bring out some more of those darks and drop the shadows a little bit. Just a quick addition of light. So basically I'm watching my histogram, making sure I'm not losing any color over here. And other than that, I'm pretty much good to go. What do we do first? We go up here to the color picker and we pick the key color. So I think the key color is probably blue in this image. And I really haven't adjusted this much. This is pretty much natural as it looked. It's a little bit lighter, but we're gonna go ahead and fix that. So select that blue, add it right here. And it selected that for me. Now we'll just go with a, let's just go with a complementary color scheme as I had discussed before. I think that displays pretty well naturally. So if we pick that key color and add it, it's gonna go ahead and pick our complementary color. So it's saying within this row, we can add any of these colors into this image and they'll probably make it look pretty damn good. So let's talk about this. These clouds are getting hit with light. So anything getting hit with light up to a certain point is gonna draw a little bit more saturation. So we could probably use one of these colors up in this region or even a brightness of a little bit higher value. So maybe somewhere up in here. So some color like that, we could probably add up in here and it'll look pretty nice. As far as the blue goes, I'd actually like to darken the blue a little bit so it adds some nice color contrast to these clouds. So if you have this really nice orange or yellow up here, to make it pop out even more, you could darken the blue in the background and see how it looks. So how can we do that? There's a few different ways we can do it. I'm just gonna show you guys how to do it really easily with Adobe Camera Raw as well as your paintbrush tool. So the first thing we're gonna do is just make a duplicate of this. So we'll go up here to Layer, Smart Objects, new smart object via copy. So that's just gonna allow us to make a brand new layer without affecting the one underneath it. So all I'll do here is go back into this. See how that opens right back up in camera roll? So I have my base layer and then I have this camera roll layer that I'm gonna just adjust this down. I'm gonna bring my blacks down so it'll just affect these blues in this upper region up here. The other thing I'll do is I'll pop back into my HSL and I can just grab the luminance of blue. Let's see what happens if I bring it down. See how that's adding some nice contrast up here? Now watch out if you get too far, it's gonna to start to get funky around the edges of this cloud. So you gotta really watch that. So maybe right in there starts to add some really nice color contrast before going overboard. If you go overboard, see how it's starting to get nasty around the edges? You just gotta watch where it goes and keep it looking natural. So I'll go back to fit in view, which will put my photo back on the screen. And if I wanted to, if I felt like this blue was too green or it had a weird funky color in it, I could see what happens if I, if I move the hue. See when I'm moving the hue, it's pulling all the green out of that blue. So if the, see how if I pull it that way, it's getting a little bit green. So from training my eye, I can tell that there's a little bit green in that blue. So I'm just gonna pull it this way to get it out of there. See how that's starting to look nicer and nicer? It's because we're aligning our colors within that complementary color harmony. The other thing I can do here is go to my saturation and I can just put a saturation. I wanna saturate this a little bit more and maybe some of these peaks. So I'll do it a little bit here, see how it looks. If I go overboard, it's gonna start to look crazy. But if I do it a little bit, it starts to look nice. So we're pulling this picture more and more in line with our color harmony. So I think that looks pretty good. And I'm gonna drop the exposure just slightly. So I'm just watching this section up in here and post-processing for that section. In a second, I'll edit for down here as well. So I'm gonna click okay. Let's see how that looks compared to the other one. So I like the top of this one. I like how that looks there. So what I'll do here is I'll just make this my base layer by dragging it down. And then I'll just put a layer mask over this. I can do it by going layer, layer mask, hide all. That's just gonna show that through. So what I can do now, is I can just bring this through. I'm gonna grab my brush tool right here. I'm just gonna go with a very low opacity brush. That means it's not gonna brush too hard. White brush. And just with some basic layer masking technique, I can just brush that back through in the bottom. I just didn't wanna clamp down those blacks too much there. Okay, so that's starting to look better. So pull those blacks back out. So a few more things we can do. I don't really want to touch the blue anymore. I feel like it's pretty in line with our color harmony right here, somewhere right in this range. And you'll notice it's pretty close to the center being white, so this blue is not too highly saturated. If we uh, make a new layer here, 
and I grab my sample picker, let's see the actual saturation value of this. See how it's very low saturation? It's still a very nice blue color, but the saturation is only at 23%. So it's gonna keep your eye moving around nicely, but it's not gonna be oversaturated. And that's about the natural saturation of the sky right there. So to add to this photo without touching the blue, we can just accentuate these yellows or oranges just a little bit more. I'll first sample one of them right here. And if you wanna sample something easily, you can just make a, a brand new layer. And you'll wanna make sure when you're on that layer, it just says sample all layers for your, your color picker tool. And once we sample this, we know that light's hitting it. So if we go down here, we can see if light's hitting it, maybe we wanna make it a little bit brighter. And when we do so, we can make it a little bit more saturated as well. So somewhere right in here. And you can see that this falls right in line with our color harmony. So we could add that, hit okay, let's do that. So what I'm gonna do here is on this actual layer, I'm gonna do add color. So with my brush tool, at a very low flow and opacity, I'll do like a 25% flow and maybe 18% opacity. And I can always dial this up and down. So I always go a little bit overboard and then dial the opacity on the layer up and down. So what I'll do is I'll just go up here to select and I'm gonna select color range. So this is actually gonna allow me to drag around on my photo. And when I drag around, you'll see that different color ranges become white. If something is white in this little image, it'll be selected and I'll be able to paint onto it. If something is black, I will not. So we wanna select something that's just gonna accentuate those orange colors. So maybe right in there. So it looks like these peaks are nice and selected and these clouds are selected. If you wanna change how drastic that is, you can drag the fuzziness up and down. So maybe something like there. Let's do that. Okay, so I've selected those now. And you can see that because the ants are marching on the screen. So I'm just gonna go up here and with my paintbrush, I just have my paintbrush now. All I'm doing is painting that color, that complementary color right onto this image. And I'm gonna hide these marching ants. So they're still selected, but you can't see them. So we'll paint a little bit up here, a little bit right here. And you'll notice even though I'm painting up in the blue area, it's not gonna go up there because the selection's been made. You could also paint it down in this area because that's in that same color range. So by using the color range tool, you can ensure that you're still gonna be using the same complementary color range and you won't be getting out into the rest of your image. So that's a, that's a really nice trick to use. If you want it to look like a nice, a nice image, just keep that saturation value pretty low. We can pull up this. We could, if we wanted to saturate it more, we could go this way a little bit more. Let's see what that looks like. We can always pull it back off. See how that's getting a little bit too much there? So maybe I'll go with like a 30% and try that a little bit. Zoom in on these peaks are just awesome looking. Look at those glaciers. It's, it's amazing. Um, huge glaciers and cloud systems coming off of that. You can just hear these crashing all over the place when you're camping out there. It's great. And I'll just add a little bit more down here. And the key is not to add too much of that complementary color. You wanna have it where those touches light are. Remember, things that touch light are gonna be in the warm side of the color wheel. Things that are cool in shadow, like these blue, will be in the cool side of the color wheel. They'll be much darker. So anything that's warm, brighter. Anything that's cool, darker. In most cases, there are circumstances when that does not happen, but usually not. So let's take a look at what this did here. I add a touch more over here, where that is, and there. And then you could even do back here where the light's barely touching. Remember, I do have a selection made, so it's gonna help me to, to make that little brush stroke right there. I just love zooming in on these and, and seeing what they look like. All right, so let's zoom back out. We'll do it before, after, before, after. And what you can do here with the opacity is just dial it down until it looks good to you. Now you can see that I painted through too much there. It kind of started to destroy the actual detail in that cloud. So that's what you gotta watch for. And you can also turn this to color. So what that's gonna do is it's not gonna change the actual details of the image, it'll just affect the colors. You can bounce back and forth with those and see what you like. Let's see what it looks like on, yeah, see how that's starting to add a little bit of color and let's try it on the normal again. It's too bright there, I could dial it down. So like right in there, before, after. See how that's starting to add little touches of orange, but it's not going overboard, right? It's just adding some nice detail. So the last step I'm actually gonna take is to develop that color a little bit more. I added some color in with my paintbrush here and I'll develop it out a little bit more. So to do that, I'm gonna hit Shift, Alt, Command, E. That's Shift, Alt, Control, E on a PC. That just makes a brand new layer, which is the combination of all the layers below it. So I'm no longer working with smart objects. I'm out of that game. So this is one of the last steps you wanna take. So there's a few different things you can do. You can use the Dodge tool, the Burn tool, or the Sponge tool. So I'll jump over here as well, and we'll paint some more Dodge in there. So I'll go here and right there. And now I'm actually going to deselect this so I can jump out of that color picker tool. The key to remember here is if you deselect things after every step, 
then you'll want to make sure that you don't have that selection going anymore. So I had a selection going. It was still working a little bit because that color picker tool was in the same color range. But if I really want to affect everything, then I have to take that selection off. So now I'm just working on the, the whole image. And watch out when you do that because it's going to try to brighten stuff that you may not want to be brightened. So I might go up here, put a few touches of light on these glaciers just to balance out the tone. Maybe right there as well. And here. You could also use what's called the sponge tool. Sponge tool will bring more color into the image. So let's let's go with a little bit of sponge tool. You see how it says saturate? Just watch how heavy-handed you use this. It will develop color very nicely and very quickly. So it will develop this orange color through here. And we could use some sponge there. And a little bit of sponge down here maybe. Just watch out how heavy-handed you go with that. And we'll do a few more touches of sponge right here. And maybe up on here. The key that I don't want to do is touch that blue because it'll just... It'll oversaturate the blue. All right, let's do what that did. Before, after, before, after. The key here is just to build slowly one layer on top of the next, and that's how you get really nice looking natural images. And you could do a little bit more down here if you wanted. You could also go with just a little levels or contrast adjustment. So if you wanted to boost this up a little bit more, you could just bring the midtones up, bring the lights up, and then darks down maybe just slightly. Try that. And all I'm doing is contrasting this a little bit more down here because it's a little bit flat, I think. So if I wanted to, I could just mask that out by hitting Command or Control I. And since we know we have a light source coming in right here, it's acceptable just to paint this through. So I can just hit D. That'll make a black and white brush. I can cycle back through with X. And I'll just paint right through here. Now I want to go with a higher flow and opacity because I don't want to paint on that all day long. I prefer to low, lower flows for color, but higher flows if other adjustments are going to be made. You can just poke that through right there as well and balance that out. So you could go see how it looks. Maybe something right in there. I think that looks all right. So this image is done. But let's go back to that crap I was rambling about earlier with lightness and brightness. Let's talk about this. If we have a light source coming in here from the side of the scene and hitting these clouds as well as the mountain and this sky back here, then the brightness of both this sky and these clouds are the same. Now the perceived brightness or lightness is going to be much different. So the sky back here being blue has a much lower perceived brightness than orange or yellow. So that's why this nice color contrast is provided here. Same brightness, but the perception of that brightness is slightly different. So if we look at our image histogram, we can see that we have blue, we have red, we have these spikes of red here, which are showing these little spikes in these orange and red areas right here, and we're not blowing out any of the color channels. So that was key there. I know that this is very early in the morning, so most of my tonal values are going to be in the far left-hand side of the histogram. There's nothing pure white in this entire image. Um, that's one big mistake that I've often made and many others often make as well, is that they think clouds are white, so they want to pull this tonal range all the way over here to the right-hand side. Well, that's completely wrong. Keep your colors nice and saturated, but don't oversaturate them, but make sure they stay in the right part of the tonal range. So luminosity, lightness, brightness, all that good stuff, keep those in mind when you're going through and editing photos. If you want another very good overview of that, check out that blog post, which I'll link right below on my website. It's going to walk you through with example images. I find that I can't learn this stuff until I see it and read it, and that's why I created both of these things for you. So hopefully you really enjoyed this. And one last thing I want to do is I want to show you guys what this looks like when it's sharpened. So full size sharpen. I'm just going to go with 2800. These are just TK actions. You can sharpen any way you want. Um, go right here and full size. So that's the final image. I didn't go too overboard here. I left a lot of dark areas to help my eyes move around. So let's think how my eyes move through this scene. My eyes probably come in right here somewhere in the foreground, maybe right in here, move up through around this area. They hit these peaks and then they move out through all these different peaks through here. I have this nice complementary blue color up here, color contrasted here, and then that touches a light that plays off the blue above and a few touches of orange in the foreground. So. Complementary colors there. You can use any different kind of color harmony, but the key is to find that key color and find a color harmony that works for your specific photo. So hope you guys enjoyed that. Have fun and thanks for tuning in. Later.